Henry Alexander Wise, the colorful and popular former governor of Virginia in 1861, appeared before the Convention of Men in Richmond. This was the Secession Convention of Virginia deciding whether Virginia, like South Carolina and a few other southern states, should leave the Union they had joined in 1787, or whether they should remain loyal to the man who was sitting in power a few hours away, Abraham Lincoln. Virginia had a strong pro-Union contingent. Many thought the state would stay in the Union. This convention itself consisted of a majority of Union men, Southern Whigs, and Weiss was among them. Up until April of 1861, Weiss was still talking about some kind of compromise between the Union, and if not a real compromise, some way of avoiding actually taking arms. Perhaps Virginia could stay in the Union, but not fight anyone, or fight in the Union. That was the construction he labored to use. Many delegates didn't agree or understand. But what, in a sense, meant was a kind of armed neutrality. We'd pick up our weapons, but wouldn't fight for the Union or the Confederacy. The Virginian Convention was divided. This state was right between the northern states and the southern states that had seceded. These men knew, as it would later turn out, that Virginia would be the battleground for any fight between the two. Men from the western region, the area that we now know as West Virginia, but at this time were voting in this Virginia convention, were against leaving the Union. The men from the southern counties of Virginia were for secession. So it was the classic third, third, third. About a third for, about a third against, and a third in between. But those in between were right now looking not to take any drastic step. On April 5th, 1861, now this is after Abraham Lincoln had been sworn in and after he made his inaugural address trying to reach out to border states like Virginia. In fact, it could be said that Abraham Lincoln's inaugural speech the mystic chords of memory that he invoked was aimed directly across the Potomac River at the Commonwealth. On April 5th, Virginia was still getting the message. The convention voted two to one against secession. There were talks between the Lincoln administration and members of this convention to try to work out some deal. But then something changed. Although Virginia did not immediately get hostile just with Abraham Lincoln's election, his actions were not received well by the population of the state. Lincoln ordered Fort Sumner in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina, resupplied. When he did that, that triggered the Charleston militia, who had held the cannons there at the harbor, to fire on the fort. And this, in Lincoln's brilliant plan, meant that the South or the rebels of South Carolina at that time, had started the Civil War. He didn't even know at that time it was going to become a Civil War, but in Lincoln's plan, which worked brilliantly, these South Carolina rebels became just that, in rebellion openly against the federal government trying to resupply a fort. Now, having sought out the moral high ground from that action, Lincoln sought to enforce federal law, take back federal property, and put down the rebellion. He called for 75,000 men to defend federal property. It was a step that the northern states were calling for, to use the awesome population of states like Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, and Michigan Massachusetts, against the rebels in South Carolina. It certainly played well with the people who had elected Lincoln. And it certainly was a necessary step. If Lincoln was going to have any power at all, he needed to enforce his actions with an army. But it didn't play well in Richmond. In the undecided state of Virginia, it angered the populace that northern troops would now possibly be moving through their state at best, and attacking them or seizing property there at worse. Even those delegates who might be for the Union, many of them now had to face populaces at home that were against it. Part of this, again, had to do with Virginia's position. If Lincoln was calling for 75,000 troops, there's only one place for those troops to go, through Virginia. Virginia either had to 
fight with them, taking arms up against their fellow Southerners, or fight against them and join the Confederacy. With this realization, opinion was changed, and former Governor Henry Wise, prominently displaying a pistol while he made his speech at the convention, said that the federal government was about to take Harper's Ferry, the same arsenal that John Brown the abolitionist had a few years before attempted to take and trying to start a rebellion among slaves in Virginia. Any hope at that point of moderation in the secession convention was gone. The convention voted for secession and the people of Virginia ratified it. Virginia was now in the Confederacy. Lincoln, perhaps caught off guard by the action of the convention, called it remarkable. And in terms of the secession crisis, the most important event. He was certainly right. It was the second revolution in the Commonwealth of Virginia, the oldest English colony. In a meeting in Williamsburg, a former barkeep turned lawyer and colorful speaker named Patrick Henry electrified a convention when he said, I know not what cause others take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Henry, along with George Mason, Thomas Jefferson, Richard Henry Lee, were among the radicals who matched every action of Massachusetts. Militia groups in Virginia roamed the western part of the state, ready to stand up against the British. Rome before the actual war started. Virginia, with its proud planters and farmers merchants resisted taxes and resisted the large debts that they had with the mother country, England, some of which they found to be unfair. Among those in the red, the future general and president, George Washington. Virginia had contributed to the French and Indian War, the battle between France and England that was fought, among other places, in the American continent, with British troops and Virginians fighting side by side. But after that war, they resisted the new taxes imposed by Parliament and new regulations imposed by that body and the actions of Governor Scott Earl of Dunmore, who ruled over the colony and saw that Parliament's rules were enforced. Marshall Fishwicks, in his History of Virginia, describes the atmosphere of Virginia in revolutionary times, this before the shots were fired in Lexington, and Concord. Revolutionary movement followed time-honored precedents. On court days in November and December 1774, the farmers of eastern Virginia met as usual and crowded on the courthouse green, heard the orators they'd always listened to hold forth on the equities of British ministry and the endangered liberties of America. As one might have expected, they ended up appointing these same leading citizens who were speaking to secure the observation of the Continental Association. This is the group that would later become the Continental Congress. It was the local gentry, not demagogues, who fanned the flame of revolution in the tidewater of Virginia, the eastern end. It was they, as we are told, who turned balls and parties into patriotic festivities, putting heads together in tables and drunkenly roaring out liberty songs. A critical and unfriendly observer in a mass meeting to hang Lord North, the Prime Minister of England at the time, in effigy, wrote that the great body of the crowd present remained looking quietly on at the scene, while a few cheering and swearing gentlemen supplied all the enthusiasm. That violent leader, Archibald Carey, put up a large pole at Williamsburg, decorated with a bag of feathers and a bucket of tar, as a little hint to any who might be found wanting in patriotism. Still, there were moderates. Some only wanted a trade embargo with England. Some wanted us to repair relations, appealing to the king in protest of Parliament. And while the most radical revolutionaries wanted to repeal all debts with England or English merchants, the conservatives and moderates felt we had to be honest and pay our debts. And for a time, the moderates put out some fires. When Governor Dunmore seized gunpowder from the Virginia militia, put it under British Redcoat Guard, claiming, however, that the militia could have it at any time within a half hour's notice. The excuse he used is that there might be a slave revolt. The reality is that Dunmore was afraid of some of the Virginia militia units, especially that headed up 
by Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry's men threatened to march and take the gunpowder by force. A committee led by Carter Braxton, a wealthy and popular merchant who would become a signer of the Declaration, met with both the governor and with Henry and worked at a deal where some of the gunpowder was made available. Revolution was put off for a time, but soon there would be no compromise. Governor Dunmore dissolved the House of Burgesses, the Assembly of Virginia, and prominent Virginians met and held their own convention in a Williamsburg tavern. This group would soon vote for independence and send Richard Henry Lee to Philadelphia to make a motion that the whole nation should be independent which he would do. Carter Braxton, once a moderate, would now become a supporter of independence, a signer of the document. In fact, he would devote all of his finances to the revolutionary effort and become penniless. Governor Dunmore, by 1775, was forced to running the colony of Virginia from a ship. The colony was in full rebellion, and the Convention of Virginia was in charge of the Commonwealth. Virginia troops fought all over the country, helped in the victory in Saratoga, put a big hurt on General Cornwallis' army in the Battle of King's Mountain, where he was forced to retreat to Yorktown, and then he would be surrounded by American and British troops, led by the Virginian George Washington, a former officer in the Virginia militia who used to fight side by side with the British. It was John Adams, a Massachusetts man, who thought that Washington would be a good general, better for a unity of the colonies than a man from the South, that a Virginian lead the army of the rebellion that had started getting violent in Massachusetts. Along with Pennsylvania and New York, Virginia was the most important colony in America. And in the beginning of the country, it included not only the area in West Virginia, which had separated after the Civil War, but also Kentucky, and, although with some disputes, all the way up into Ohio. Virginia, the Commonwealth, still known today as Old Dominion, an unlikely name for a revolutionary birthplace, such an important state in American life and politics. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, Zachary Taylor, John Tyler, William Henry Harrison, and Woodrow Wilson were born in Virginia. That's eight presidents. It was the home state of five of them, birthplace of the writer of the Declaration and the nation's most popular general and first president. It was the scene of many of the battles, both in the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, some on the same fields. No wonder, as a historian once wrote, the history of America is the history of Virginia. Old Dominion, the Commonwealth earned that name for its loyalty to Britain, its loyalty to an English king. When the English Civil War occurred, and England was taken over by Oliver Cromwell, his protectorate, Virginia stayed loyal to the Stuart kings. It closed its port, trading only with its fellow colony Massachusetts, the Caribbean, and with France, but not with England. When the Stuart King Charles was restored to the throne, the colony opened back up for business, and Charles rewarded the colony that had been so loyal to his family with the title Old Dominion. It was the only one of all the king's dominions to remain loyal. Yet the taxes that the current British king and British parliament imposed hurt Virginia's merchants, and the large debts they had with Britain hurt planters we said, George Washington among them. Their interference with local governments and the nervous mismanagement of Lord Dunmore sealed the deal. Virginia was also the birthplace of the constitutional government. The Mount Vernon Conference of 1785, held at George Washington's home, was an attempt to negotiate the Potomac River between two states that, immediately after the Revolution, were like sovereign nations, Maryland and Virginia. In resolving their disputes, it became clear that we would have to work together as a nation to form one federal government. It led to future conferences and eventually to the Constitutional Convention in 1787. There, it was the Virginia Plan, authored by the Virginian James Madison, 
which was the rough sketch of the Constitution. The Virginia Plan isn't a complete Constitution, but many of the elements are there. And many of the prominent supporters of the Constitution were from Virginia, most notably James Madison and George Washington, whose prestige helped to pass the document. But Virginia was a large state and had a diversity of opinion. And it also became home to the other point of view in early American politics, resistance to government and anti-federalism. The outspoken patriot, Patrick Henry, didn't go to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia saying simply, I smell a rat. And when the convention finished its business, he opposed the constitutional government they had formed, loosely known as anti-federalists, although those opposing the Constitution disagreed with this term that didn't fully express their viewpoint. They would have preferred a term like anti-nationalists. They were against a large national government. They were all for a government where states had the power and were just joined in a federation. But this is not what the Constitution was about. These anti-federalists, enough of them in any way, insisted on a Bill of Rights before they would vote to ratify the Constitution. At the Virginia Ratification Convention, there were enough delegates who were anti-federalists who opposed the Constitution, who agreed to vote for it if a Bill of Rights would be added. Not all of them. Patrick Henry didn't want the Constitution and, in fact, opposed adding a Bill of Rights for the very reason that he knew if the Bill of Rights passed, the Constitution would pass as well. George Mason insisted on a Bill of Rights, and James Madison saw the writing on the wall, saw where the Virginia Ratification Convention was going, and agreed that since the Constitution had an amendment procedure, it wasn't a perfect document, and the delegates to the Constitutional Convention realized it would have to be from time to time adjusted, that he would agree to certain amendments and would push them through if the Constitution was voted. These amendments would become known as the Bill of Rights. A similar compromise would be worked out in Massachusetts and in other states during their ratification conventions. But it was really Virginia that sealed the deal. When Virginia ratified the Constitution, we had a constitutional government. There was no turning back. For one reason, Virginia had George Washington, who was very likely to become the nation's first occupant of that office in the Constitution called a President of the United States. Another reason was its population. One-fifth of Americans at the time lived in Virginia. To understand Virginia's importance in the 13 states at that time, you'd probably have to combine the states of California and New York. That's how important Virginia was. Couldn't determine policy on their own, just as California and New York can't. Couldn't elect the president on their own. The plan that they introduced into the Constitutional Convention didn't exactly become the Constitution. There had to be further compromise. People in other parts of the country got their say. But boy, was Virginia ever influential. With one four-year interruption of Massachusetts' own John Adams. Four presidents, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe, born in Virginia, all of them would get two terms, leading John Adams to say his son John Quincy could not become president until all Virginians ceased to exist. Yet the dynasty didn't hold. Although Zachary Taylor and William Henry Harrison were born in Virginia, and lived in Virginia. Both were more associated with their home states of Louisiana and Indiana, respectively. John Tyler was from Virginia, but he had been elected vice president and would obtain the presidency after William Henry Harrison's death. The Virginia dynasty was over. As new states were created in Virginia's territory, and as population moved, you can see Virginia's political power decreasing with its number of electoral votes, from 24 electoral votes in 1788, when George Washington was elected unanimously by the Electoral College, to 25 in 1800, when Thomas Jefferson, another son of Virginia, was elected. It dropped to just 15 electoral votes in 1860. And after the loss of voting population during the Civil War in 1866, 
Virginia had just 11 votes. Today it has just two more, 13 votes. But in the percentages, we see even more how Virginia's power and influence has declined. Those 13 votes are just 2% of the total nation's electoral vote. Whereas in 1788, when they elected their own Washington, they held 8% of the electoral votes. Some of this is due to the decision of Virginia in that convention in April 17th of 1861 to fight Abraham Lincoln, to fight the Union in the Civil War. Henry A. Wise, the former governor who led the charge in the convention, became a Confederate general. Robert E. Lee, a relative of the patriot and signer of the Declaration of Independence, Richard Henry Lee, became the head of armies. Jeb Stuart, the key cavalrymen supporting Lee. Virginians brought population, resources, and probably most importantly, prestige to this new confederacy. And as evidence of that, upon Virginia's secession, the capital of the confederacy was moved from Montgomery, Alabama, north to Richmond. With Virginia, the confederacy got real. Yet, in the end, Virginians did not benefit. So many of the Civil War battles were conducted in the Commonwealth. Virginia's cities read like a history of the war. Fredericksburg, Petersburg, Charlottesville, Appomattox. Four years of blood ravaged the proud state. After the war, military government was followed by an appointed New Yorker who ran the state for a few years. Then, a Republican governor, Bill Mahone, with the support of newly enfranchised black voters and white moderates. On the presidential level, Virginians didn't get to vote again for president until 1872. And then they voted for the Republican Ulysses S. Grant. But that changed as more former Confederates got the vote back. When the state voted for Democrats in 1876, when they voted for Sam Tilden, and 1880 when they voted for Winfield Scott. By 1883, the Commonwealth was taken over by a Redeemer government, consolidating Democratic control. Virginia helped put Grover Cleveland in the White House in 1884 and helped to put Cleveland back into the White House in 1892. They voted against McKinley in 1896 and 1900. The state's Democrats battled between progressives and conservatives. Thomas Staples Martin demonstrated the Virginia form of a progressive Democrat. He was a railroad lawyer, and he persuaded the legislature to vote him into the Senate, despite the fact that Fitzbug Lee, nephew of the hero general on the Confederate side, was widely expected to win the Senate seat. A later investigation would show that Martin used railroad money to secure the votes he needed in the legislature. Despite his lavish use of corporate money, Martin could be a progressive. He aligned the Virginia's Democrats with William Jennings Bryan, helping Bryan to win the nomination in 1896. He supported silver money, the idea of inflating the currency to provide more money for farmers. But Martin also helped to put through the 1900 Virginia Constitutional Convention, a constitution that voted on one hand to set up a new state commission regulating corporations, which today to modern ears sounds like a very progressive ideal, and the other end set up a poll tax and literacy test to try to discourage blacks from voting. For most progressives looking at this today, they're scratching their head. But this was Thomas Martin's style of progressivism. Virginia was no longer the influential, proud state that it had been in early America. It was the Commonwealth. It was the land that some said the time forgot. 600,000 people left the Commonwealth between 1880 and 1900. The state was losing population and gaining new ones at half the national average. Throughout the years that Teddy Roosevelt was in office, Virginia supported Democrats. Virginia would enthusiastically vote in Woodrow Wilson was 60% of the vote. Although Wilson was the president of Princeton University, one of the South's favorite northern colleges, and he was the governor of New Jersey, and that was listed as his home state at the time of election. He certainly had spent a lot of time there. Wilson was a Virginia man, 
when he ran the country, aware of his base of support in the South. The federal government was completely segregated under Wilson's watch. In many ways, Virginia was a member of the Solid South, that base of electoral votes that would help Grover Cleveland or Woodrow Wilson. Throughout the teens and 20s, even candidates who would lose the rest of the country, James Cox, John W. Davis, could count on the votes of Virginia. Yet in a few instances, Virginia would depart from the Solid South. In 1928, when the Democratic nomination went to the Catholic governor of New York, Al Smith, Virginia voted for Herbert Hoover. And in 1952 and 1956, when Eisenhower ran, Virginia voted for the hero general. They would vote for Kennedy in 1960 and LBJ in 1964. But after Lyndon Johnson, until this most recent election, Virginia would become a reliable, what we now call a red state. Republican. So Republican that it was ignored by both camps. It was obvious to Republicans they would win and obvious to Democrats they would lose throughout the 80s and 90s. What helped to lock up Virginia's reputation as a red state was the 1976 election between President Ford and Democratic candidate Jimmy Carter. By running Carter, Democrats hoped to put the South in play, and it worked to an extent. The first homegrown president to come from the Deep South since James Polk in the 1840s. Carter won Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, North Carolina, Louisiana, Missouri, and Mississippi, but not Virginia. It was a hotly contested state, however, in that year. But Virginia was won by incumbent President Ford. Close margin, 836,554 to 816,896. Ford won suburban counties in the D.C. area like Fairfax and Loudoun, but lost the western counties like Lee and Wise. Carter was able to put the New Deal coalition of farmers and urbanites together, winning the rural westernmost county of Lee by 1,000 votes and also the city of Richmond, the urban area, by 7,000 votes. But it wasn't enough. Even in urban areas in, 17, in 1976, Ford kept it close, holding Carter to a 6% margin in Alexandria, city near D.C. In Arlington County, Carter won by... Just 1,000 of the 62,000 votes cast. Ford won the closest suburbs of D.C., Loudoun, Prince William, and Fairfax counties. Nova, as Northern Virginia is now called, was Ford country. And the state would elect Democrats as governors, electing the nation's first black governor in 1989. It would have competitive Senate races. Chuck Robb held the seat for many years, but generally favored Republicans. On the presidential level, it wasn't even close. The state was not wooed by Southerner Jimmy Carter, and it supported Reagan twice, Bush Sr. twice. It wasn't charmed by the second Southerner to run as the Democratic candidate in recent years, Bill Clinton, voting for President Bush Sr. and Bob Dole. Virginia was not even on the table under consideration for 2000. Al Gore didn't even think about it. Kerry's campaign would not even consider it a swing state. Nobody did in 2004. Thus far, we've seen several phases in the Commonwealth of Virginia's history. From a Federalist supporting the Constitution, albeit with a strong opposition, led by the Eastern Merchants, to its time as the home of the Jeffersonian Republican Party, also called the Republican Democrats, easily blending to support of the Jacksonian Democrats. A reliable member of the Solid South voting Democrat, from the Civil War to the 1950s, to a Republican red state, voting reliably Republican, even in 2004, voting 53% for President Bush. Now, while we can't say quite whether this is a new phase in Virginia's political history, it certainly seems so, as a lot changed in 2008. The state with 21% of its electorate being African American, and with some fairly recent success in Senate and governor elections for Democrats, became a target for the Obama campaign. This year, in 2008, the Democratic candidate was extremely well funded and didn't have to make some tough choices. They could try some new states, and Virginia was on the list. 
But the biggest factor in Obama's win here had to be demographic. The region called Nova, Northern Virginia, has grown in population, while the West, Central, and South has held to just a small growth or even decrease. These new voters are bringing Virginia a bit more into the blue category, aligning the state more with the D.C. area, more with the eastern seaboard. A comparison between 1976, where President Ford won, and 2008, where Barack Obama won, is useful. Where President Ford beat Democrat Jimmy Carter in Fairfax County, right outside of D.C., where 202,000 people voted in 1976. Obama beat McCain with over 510,000 people voting there in 2008. More than doubled. And he got over 100,000 vote margin there. He won Arlington County by 48,000 votes, where the amount of voters doubled. McCain got nearly the same amount of votes as Ford got there 22 years before. But Obama got 48,000 more. Lauding County, which Ford had won in 1976, is a bit more of an exurb of the D.C. area. But Obama won with a 14,000 vote margin there. In Alexandria City, right outside of D.C., Obama got a 30,000 vote margin. And the population in that city doubled since Carter narrowly won there in 76. Meanwhile, in Lee County, a rural county in the western tip of the state, where Jimmy Carter, the southerner, appealed 22 years ago, Obama lost there. And he lost by a lot. He only got about 35-36% of the vote. But the population in Lee County has only gone from 8,000 voters to 10,000 voters in 22 years. That's a drop in the bucket for McCain when considering the numbers that he was losing in the North. In Wise County, near Vitaly, the number of votes barely increased at all between 1976, when Carter won there, and 2008, when McCain won there. The entire electorate in this county went from 12,700 to 13,150 in 22 years. Meanwhile, in some of the areas in Nova, as we indicated, population was doubling. Add this to a, to a big Obama margin in the city of Richmond and in Henrico County, the suburb area of Richmond. The city and suburb taken together, a 70,000 vote margin for Obama. Where Jerry Ford beat Carter in the city and suburb combo by 17,000 votes. That's a big change. There's no doubt that the combination of demographic changes in Virginia and the decision by Democrats to commit a lot of time and resources to the state put this state in the swing category and maybe by the tail end of the election of 2008, it wasn't even in swing category anymore. Most political observers believe that Virginia is now at least in the swing category for future presidential elections. Of course, we'll have to see. But by naming Tim Kaine, as DNC chair, usually the prerogative of the winning incumbent president, Obama's making a statement about Virginia, and it's clear that he sees it as important in the 2012 election. If all of Obama's initiatives fail, and if he becomes a only a moderately popular president, if he ekes through in a re-elect like President Bush did, or Woodrow Wilson, or Truman did, maybe Virginia's no longer on the map for 2012. Maybe it reverts back to its long history in recent years as a red Republican state. But on balance, it looks like Virginia is going to be swing for some time. And given the large population growth in the areas near D.C., its politics may be coming a lot closer to a New Jersey or Pennsylvania, its identity becoming closer to the eastern seaboard than to its southern brethren. If you're a Democrat, you're no doubt enjoying the fact that Virginia has been at least put back in the swing category. With a look at history, it's interesting to see that Virginia has now become once again a decider state, an influential state in American politics, a status it hasn't had in quite a while. With History Beating Up Politics, I'm Bruce Carlson. I want to thank you for listening. The website is myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. I also wanted to let you know My History Can Beat Up Your Politics is now on Facebook. So if you're on there, come join 
the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics fan group. Uh, if you type in My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, I'm sure it uh, comes up. Otherwise, there's a link on the website at MyHistoryCanBeatUpYourPolitics.com. There is the archive. That's available, 1999. Some topics coming up. I'm looking at amendments to the Constitution. I'm looking at Jimmy Carter's uh, first year, 1977, as president, comparing that to Obama's so far. And though it's a lot of research that I have to do away, we've got to take a look at financial panics of the past.